Pierre Lafontaine is not a household name in the traditional sense. He doesn't have million dollar sports contracts, despite the fact that he has always been on top of his game for decades. He has worked with the world's top swimmers and cyclists, guided the country's top student athletes, and worked hand in hand with national and Olympic athletes from around the world. What's unique about Pierre's ability to move within the sports circles is that he's doing it as well with politicians and business leaders. In the name of sports, Pierre has seen it all. Straight out of the playbook, he knows the politics of sport, the agony and ecstasy of defeat and of victory as well for the athletes. But this isn't really a podcast about training the country's elite athletes. It's about how we as people, as humans, are meant to be active and healthy, both physically and mentally. How sport is supposed to be about moving and training our bodies, being focused, working together as a team and enjoying success. Getting a nation active and healthy is a massive task, but people are laying the foundation. The National Health and Fitness Foundation is made up of members of parliament, senators, and government leaders to help Canadians lead healthier, active lifestyles. A National Health and Fitness Day actually exists. Did you actually know that? Maybe that wasn't covered in the phys ed class that we didn't have to take, or maybe it wasn't mentioned as kids are playing a single sport from the time they are born with a parent dreaming of them going pro one day. More on this and so much more in our chat today with Pierre. Pierre, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to have you and so excited also that this has been able to be a podcast that is provided to you by Extension Marketing. So welcome to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, as always, you can head to extensionmarketing.com. I want to say like, oh. welcome home. Is this like a welcome <laughs> home? You've been traveling and working all the way around the world for so long. Is it nice to be back? It's so nice. And, you know, I got to tell you, I moved back to Ottawa in 2005, but I was in Canmore for a while. I was here and there. You were and, in Australia. Uh, You've in been Australia. in Georgia. You've been in Arizona. <laughs> but um, I, I actually have to say that when I took the job here with Swimming Canada in 2005, I told the, the board of directors, I said, you know, there's no way I'm going to live in Ottawa. So you have to give me an, an, a year. You know, growing up in, in the West Island of Montreal. And I said, give me a year and I'll figure out where to move the office. But I, I, I can't live in Ottawa. You know? So after the, a year, the board says, so what are you doing? What are you doing with the office? And I go, there's no way I could move from here. This is an incredible place to get no park. And I remember even meeting the, the mayor Gatineau at a certain time saying early on saying, I want to help you. Ottawa is a great cosmopolitan. I want to help the city of Gatineau to get away from the shadow of, uh, of Ottawa because you've got incredible infrastructure or you know, parks and so on. And then the music scene here, the winter carnival, the, you know, when, when I skate here, the, the, the canal, I probably skate 30 or 40 times a year, you know, I'm just looking forward to it. So this is an incredible place to I live. I know that, and, but uh, you're saying that right now because you take advantage of all the things that there are to offer in terms of nature and activity. Like I can see you talking right now and I can see you <laughs> thinking, run in the Gatineau Hills, a cycle in the Gatineau Hills, a swim in at Meech Lake. Like I can see you because you're enjoying what you can do and in an active way. Some people are kind of going, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. But... I remember I was I was uh, skating on a canal one day last year. So that day was one of those simple Sunday. So Sunday morning, it was beautiful. So we went skating on the canal, did twice up and down. By the way, I want to start next year kind of a, a century skating fundraiser. So so we could raise money for a cause. I'd like probably across the, the, the speed skating club in Ottawa, mm -hmm. but skate 100 kilometers on the canal. I think it'd be really cool, that something to do. But so that Have morning- you figured out how many times it would be back and forth? Yeah, I think canal? it was seven, eight times, depending on which way seven, we go. Seven, eight times. Up and there, down. Up and down, like they're back. Yeah, yeah. It's a long and day. Anyway, so, so that day I went skating early in the morning and then I said, oh, I was at a friend's house. I said, why don't we just go for breakfast at Lansdowne? And I'm starting to walk around and she goes, no, 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 no. Let's just kind of walk across the canal. So that morning we walked across the canal and walked to Lansdowne and went for breakfast. And then, then that afternoon I went skiing to Gatineau Park. And all I could remember was, I need to start a blog. Like, why do I love Ottawa blog? Because it's an incredible place to be active. And even when I was working with Cross Country Ski Canada, we started a, 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 a motto saying, embrace winter. And, uh, and in Canada... You have to go and say, you know what? I'm going to be here. I'm going to enjoy every moment of it. I even remember calling a friend, uh, you know, he's VP of CN, when CN gave a lot of money for the, uh, for the Syrian refugee uh, group. And I called him up and I said, you know, 
I think you guys should give these each new families a toboggan with CN on it and say, welcome to winter. Because really, we have to educate and, and celebrate the greatness of this country in the winter and in the summer. And, um, and so to me, this is really, um, yes, I'm excited about this community. I'm actually really excited about this country and what we could do as, as world leaders, not just in environment, but, but also making you know, the world a healthier place. And, uh, and let's start at home. And, uh, and it make, let's make Canada the fittest nation on earth. Yeah, I love that motto. It's interesting to see where you could come from with it and, and where it can go. And so I want to be able to hit on that. But I think people need to have a better understanding because you just mentioned like when you were working with cross-country skiing. But then I know that you were working as, tum- you know, swimming has been a massive Most background. Most of my life. Uh, you know, cycling. I know that you've, as we mentioned, you've worked in Australia and in the States and in Arizona. Like you have been sought after in different sports for Mm -hmm. your passion, for your coaching, for how to be able to take a team to a different level. Were you an active kid? Like, I mean, looking at you now, I mean, I know that sport is part of your daily activity, but was it like that growing up? Yeah. So I grew up in Beaconsfield in in the West Island and we lived right on the water. So, you know, we either skated on on the river or uh, Lake St. Louis. Or uh, we had a sailboat and a motorboat, so we would go water skiing. So yes, I was quite active, but we went to um, we went to school downtown as a high school, so it was always a problem going back and forth. We'd lose a lot of time in the car, so I, I was. Um, but um, I really got into you know I, I I'm a believer even early on, and I, I guess my role model is probably my mother, who's ninety actually on Saturday. Um, and her world was about making a difference in people's lives. And, uh, and I always felt, you know, so yes, I was doing a lot of things for me, but I always thought being part of a team wasn't just about me, but it was about building an environment where everybody feels, and I was young thinking that, where everybody feels like they're part of something special. Yeah, winning is really important, especially when you lose, you kind of go, ah, ah. but the experience, and not a lot of people win, the experience of being part of something magical to me is, uh, was always early on, you know, something that I was looking for and, uh, and trying to get other people involved. I wasn't just doing street hockey, but we tried to get as many people in the neighborhood to play street hockey and so on and so forth. You know? When did the coaching aspect then start for you? Because that, I think, was really the launch into what was going to be the next couple of decades for you. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, I go back to mom. So um, the PQ in Quebec uh, was quite a, um, a socialist um, uh, government, but it was incredible at making decisions to make people um, first to a certain point. And one of them was um, they they mandated that every school or every child in institution that were disabled be put in school. Every child had the right to be educated. And so mom ended up being the principal of a school for kids that are autistic in the 70s, autistic Down wow. syndrome and so on, and happened to be a, sc- a pool in that school uh, in Beaconsfield, John F. Kennedy School, by the way, which is an interesting one con- considering the Kennedys started the, you know, in special O. Um, so I, mom said, would you ever be interested in teaching two, three times a week our program? And meanwhile, I was in part of the Point Clair uh, program when we had started a program with a lady called Mrs. Campbell called Aquapercept. And actually, I'll tell you the people that were pretty incredible in that, in that group. One guy, guy was David William, Dave William, who was an astronaut for Canada. A guy called Scott Haldane, who was CEO of YMCA Canada and chair of, of uh, the Rideau Foundation. Karen O'Neill, who was chair of uh, the Rick Hansen Foundation, is now the CEO of the, Car- the Paralympic Committee, the Canadian Paralympic Committee, myself. So we had, we were this, four this of us. This was the group of you that, that were was That kind of started the, par- the, the, wow. the Equa Percept in Point Lair. So it was one of those from early 70s to 76. Um, so I was basically d- dealing with um, kids with learning disabilities or kids with disabilities. So, and in 76, one guy called Tom Johnson, who still coaches in Vancouver, said, would you ever be interested in coaching little kids? And I said... Yeah, you know, why not? I was starting university in, at Concordia, and I said, yeah, let's go. And there we go. I really wanted to be a veterinarian, but, um, you know, coaching just takes on a life of its own when you create daily smiles for kids because they've reached levels that never thought they would even reach, you know, whether they're eight-year-old or, or Olympic people. 
So it just kind of grabbed me and I never looked backwards, you know, and, you know, I felt, always felt that life was a sum of experience. So I just kind of kept looking for experience to, so you start then moving from the school and special needs, which I think is amazing back in the 70s to have mm -hmm. that outlook and to be able to have that outreach for, for parents and for those students back then to getting into a more mainstream. Did you, I mean, now you look at it and there's certifications and, you know, there's a lot of things that allow you the ability to step in mm -hmm. and, and be able to coach kids. Were you part of all of that? Did you you know, need to experience and go through the levels and, and you know, educate yourself too on each of the sports. Yeah, so it, it started early on, late 70s, early 80s. I did get a scholarship from the coaching association as an apprentice coach in 1980 with a, with a fellow called Yano Tiani. Yano was Alex Bowman's coach in okay. Sudbury. And so I get lucky. You know, I, I have to touch wood all the time because I, I've been blessed with, I'm not sure if it's great mentors or great people, I believe that the world could only be changed through people, not just things, you know. And I've been blessed to be touched by a handful of uh, magical people to help me grow as a person and as a coach. But um, I also believe that all the education um, that can be given um, can't be replaced um, just by words. It's got to be uh, live as a coach. You got to live it. It's got to be part of you. Like you could be a good teacher, but to be a great teacher, it almost needs to be a complete passion and almost part of you. And I think to be a great coach, the difference between a good and a great one, I think it's uh, it's your daily willingness to make a difference in somebody's life. And um, so I did go through the coaching levels early on and so on and so forth. I do think that Canada's probably got one of the best coaching program in the world. Uh, a lot of countries are looking after or following us and saying, you know, we want part of your program. Is this for swimming or is this... Oh, no, no, all, this, all sports. This is for all sports. The all way sports, including... Yeah, I mean, swimming is also well right. sought after. But you're telling me that world, world organizations are looking at what Canada has done with their coaches? Coaching associations. The coaching yeah, associations. Yeah, yeah. Why, why is that? Oh, I think the structure is extremely uh, well planned. The government, you know, basically mandated that we all have a long-term athlete development program, which is to make sure that our athletes are well surrounded. We don't burn them too young and so on. So there's been a lot of great movement within the sports in Canada um, to not only secure, but also educate coaches so that there is a long-term planning. You know, you don't win the Olympics at 12, you win the Olympics at in many sports late in their 20s. So, but an athlete is going to go through likely a number of different coaches mm -hmm. from the time they're in the grassroots kind of, yes, of let's yes, go yes. like learn to swim program uh, until you see them, you know, you know, step onto the, the starting block. You know, so th that's Olympics. why I think um, I, I believe that the strength of a great athlete is not just um, the coaching. Uh, it's not just um, how he swims or she swims. But it's how the environment around them creates a magical place for them to go and train every day. I'll give you the best example. I moved here in 2005 uh, from Australia. My kids had really never seen snow before in their lives because I lived in Arizona before that. And uh, not long after that, our, our kids joined uh, cross country. Ski, uh, two boys joined a cross country ski program, and, uh, and they end up at Nacker Talk up on, in Cantley. Mm -hmm. Great program. Yes, it is. And. Um, one, one day, is it one of those typical minus 28 Friday night? There's not a, a moon in, in this, everything's so dark. And my 12 year old son, Mark Andre, says, uh, Hey, dad, you got to drive me to workout. Now, as a coach, I hate when kids miss workout. You know, it's a complete disrespect to, to the team and to coach. And I go, Really? really? <laughs> it's minus 28. You know, that means I've got to stay there and kind of ski too. And, he goes, yeah, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. So I went and um, I drove him there, six o'clock. I even, I remember I even said, don't you want to go and play at a friend's house or something? And he goes, uh, no, no, just go. So I go and drive him. And uh, the coach, the coach in Necker Talk at that time was this guy called Mike Vieira, who actually works for the Paralympic Committee now, Canadian Paralympic Committee. I incredible with kids. And uh, I drop him off, open the door. Minus 28 on a Friday night at 6 o'clock at night. And there was a cacophony. I don't know if that's a right word. There was so much noise of kids giggling and running outside, playing soccer with a beach ball on skis. 
And I remember that was kind of an awe moment for me going, I got goosebumps, I'm telling you. It was like, this guy can create magic with these kids. And I do believe that, you know, we could have the best organization in the world. The, the dream and the magical moment must be created by the coaches with support around the, the people, the, those people. And uh, they're the ones that are going to get the eight-year-old in a pool or in a soccer field inspired or the 25-year-old to keep going on, on a bad year. And, uh, and so the importance of coaching education is one, but great coaches, they do it because they want to be great, not just because they're educated. I love that. That's a great story because you realize if there were that many kids showing up, you know, there was a reason because I would have definitely been in the car. <laughs> when I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay back on, back on this one. I, I was embarrassed now, to even right. think that way. But, it but it's so true and it's happened to all of us. And I know that there's a ton of parents listening, you know, when they're having to get up for that 5 a.m., 6 a.m. ice time, right? Like we, yeah. there, there is a community involved in, in that the parent is able to get up and say, let's go. And, you know, it's, it's a trickle or a domino effect. Now, you're at this point talking about the fact that we're talking about kids who are already active and in these sports. And yet, I know we had a discussion on the lack or the change in the phys ed systems or the the need to be able to create constant active living for our kids in school. For all kids. For all kids, right? right? And I think when you talk about having Canada as the fittest nation... It, it it starts when you're in you know grade three and are like given the option. Well, oh, we're not going to do phys ed today. I, we didn't have that option yeah, as yeah. kids, and I think we have a different mentality towards it. I, I don't think it starts in grade three. I think it starts at home when they're, they're two year old and right. you put uh, the two year old in, in in the sled when you go cross country skiing, or you go and put um, put the, the little one um, you know on a bike behind you, or go hiking. It, it becomes um, a, dis- a daily decision that parents need to make. You know, like I said to you earlier, you know, talking to, to my son, who's his son, who's five years old, going to school on Thursday. And I said, let's make sure we put him on his bicycle and, and ride him to school so that he understands that it's a great option, not just a yellow bus. And it's probably a kilometer away. But these are the type of things that as a as a person, you need to think, how do I make that happen uh, in, in a family? Right. But Pierre, it's hard to make that happen for the children when that's not a, a daily aspect or important in the lives of the parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there, you know, I could right. talk to you about an idea there, okay. but, but um, I, I also believe that um, I, I, I tend to think when we grew up, the school, the great school, was where we went and play. That's where the baseball diamond was. That's where the soccer field. That's where the, we'd hit the tennis ball on the wall on the weekend. The, the local, regional, the lo- local school was our playground often, and. Um, and so I think we need to go back to using the school grounds on the weekends and so on and so forth as a, as a place to play. Which would be great if it wasn't of the mentality that you can't now allow your kids to go out and play. When we yeah, were yeah. young, it was like you went out and you came back when the street lights came on and you were out for the day. And you get the, the bell going, dinner you time. You can hear ding, it, ding, right? Ding, like, ding. And you just knew that that was the time to go home. That's right. Now there's, I'm not saying a helicopter parent, but people are less likely to have their kids out on their own uh, without supervision, even though if they are doing that supervision, they're on their smartphones looking down anyway, because that's where the attention, you know, seems to be. So we're, we're and then as, if we're not letting the kids go out and play on their own because we feel like they can go and do that, then we're like exhausted and just let them sit at home and play on the devices. And so I find that we are in a wicked, horrible kind of circular wheel, yeah. wheel that we're not able to get out of. I, I think, you know, we, we could look at what we don't have. And I would like to look at what's possible. And what's possible is, is changing lives a bit at a time. You know, we're never going to have perfection. Perfection doesn't exist anyway. And actually, perfection is a perfect way to fail. I think if we get excellence through things we do, we get better at it, then excellence is always achievable because you get better and better and better. So to go back to the school system, um, if the kids are in an environment where the school actually is a great place for kids to play, then kids will want to play more and more. But if the school is overprotective and you can't go out and it's cold and so on and so forth. You can't have balls now sometimes outside. These are decisions, though, that, that the, the, the politicians and the policies within insurance world or the government needs to make because we need to be healthier. It's better long term. 
But it's also the one place in the world that every kid could play is in the school system. No other places where there's some kids that with, without the, the means, they can't go and, and go to the track meet or join, join a swim team or even get a bike. And so, so the school has to become and come back to being the place where it's safe, it's exciting, but there's also a place to learn, you know, new skills, uh, physical skills. And, you know, don't take me wrong. I, I actually think it's really important to have a, a music program at school, mm -hmm. too. Those are two basic confidence-building um, uh, skills that are really important for our kids. Because it's all about confidence-building. It's all about, wow, I've never done this before. And I, I could do this, you know? See, for me, too, those are the two, one of the most important aspects of being in school. I'm being exposed to it. And yet those are the programs that are cut first. Yeah, But, you know, there's a lot of parents that could probably, if they want to help create an environment for their kid, they need to get involved. I remember, you know, my spouse used to say, used to, say to me, you know, why are you, you know, although I got four kids, I was on every board for the kids. And I go, you know, yes, it takes a lot of my time, but it's because I want to make sure that I'm part of creating the environment that I feel is going to be important for my kids to grow. So we do have to get involved. I hate to say it. It's not easy. It's, I'd love to sit on the side of the soccer field watching the practice sometime, but I have no rights when other volunteers uh, you know, are taking care of my kids. I have a duty to be part of the solution and part of helping making this country special. So what is your tip then for parents? Like, what are you saying? This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally, as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Ask, ask, what can I do to help? That's all, you know? And often people don't go there because they don't want to disturb. I think it's as easy as saying, What can I do to help? You know, can I just carry snacks for the kids for practice? Or can I, you know, just help the kid in the soccer, in the goal? But just ask how, to, how you could help. Because really, um, very few people will say no. And everybody wants, a, you know, this place to be better for kids. At the end, a country that invests in kids invests in a future. And to me, You know, it's not just investing in money, it's investing in programming, it's investing in inspiration, it's investing in more people being part of a feeling they're part of a family. Uh, and you know what, it's interesting. We've had this discussion before because we, we met once and I think that's why I, I was excited to have you in because the, the discussion and the dialogue was, was very passionate on both of our, <laughs> on both of our parts. And I, I know this is bringing me back because you were talking about the school system and the schools. And I remember one of the things that you mentioned was we have these schools, we have these gyms that after four or five o'clock at night, like in the afternoon, they shut down. And yet these are facilities, these are places that can be used and can be housed for other programs. And we're not taking advantage of that. I mean, totally. And, I, you know, I, I'm not saying every school. I remember my mom and dad, when I was a young guy, would go and play in a high school in Beaconsfield, the high school, Beaconsfield High School, play badminton every Tuesday and Thursday night. And uh, it costs almost nothing. And so to me, you know, we've got government-owned infrastructure, we need to open them, making them accessible at a cheap rate for volunteer parents group that are running clubs to get kids involved. And uh, and so we do have the land. We have to work. I think we have to work with the insurance companies to say, you know what, let's find a way to allow access to these facilities to kids that are not part of the school or whatever. And I'm not an insurance guy, but there's got to be a way. If there's a will, there's a way. So if the vision is that we should have access to these gyms to 11 o'clock at night, not just for kids, but for adults, because we, we need to get adults back into playing, you know, not just the dragon boat and working hard, but just to go and, and do yoga at 10 o'clock at night. We need adults to, sh to be part of being healthier, number one, but also show as grandparents that the little kids could go and play with them, you know. So to me, we need to, to open and not say... If I have to say the, the big difference between my in my world tour 
you come to Canada often and, and there's too many times saying, well, the government, you know, doesn't give me a grant. And I'm saying, I, I think there's a lot of ways that we could run programs without waiting for the government. You know, we are Canada. You know, we are the country we want to create. The, can, the, the government will facilitate, but it's not just the answer. We are the answer. So is it going to a school principal and saying we would like to have access to your gym between 5 and 10 at All night to be able to host uh, badminton on Monday and volleyball on Tuesday and it not being always part of a organized league or... Yeah, or, the, you know, for somebody to say, well, the maintenance staff... I remember when I grew up, the maintenance staff would work from midnight till 6 in the morning because... The gym and the school was used all night long, you know. So maybe it is finding ways to open the grounds to uh, to allow access to these gyms, all the gyms in a whole country. You know, part of National Health and Fitness Day was we wanted to open every gym, every rink, every pool, every soccer field with programs for one day in the country where we could celebrate active living, not just fitness, not just winning or lose, just go out and play. You know, very much in the same concept of, you know, let's not take an elevator for one floor. Let's go walk this fl a flight of stairs, you know? So this was a day, so it was last December that it was, that it was passed, right? That June 1st? Yeah, actually it was, it was, um, it was June 1st of June, the first Saturday of June okay. every year is National Health and Fitness Day. Okay. That was passed unanimously in the federal government as a day of active living, which was done in, in, uh, all parties voted completely um, for it, and it was in 2014. So it was really a cool day because you, you could see, I remember the whole concept with the National Health and Fitness Foundation or day started in a plane when I was sitting beside a fellow coming back from Vancouver, and he looked in shape, and I go, wow, like, you look great. What do you do for a living? He says, oh, I'm a brand new MP from Vancouver. I'm going to, to Ottawa. And I go, wow, we got five hours. Let me tell you what I think. <laughs> and it was this guy called John Weston who was magical. And about three weeks after our discussion, I said, you know, if you guys in the government create a vision for the country, people like me in the sports world or in the art world, people will make it happen. But let's scream it from the top of our lungs that we can be active and and artistic and musical and let's make let's give the power to the people to make that happen and then we'll we'll create it but we need a government that will create a vision for the country and uh, and so i've decided that making canada the fittest nation on earth was a great way to start i'll put it out there very much like what i did with cross country skiing you know that this motto embrace winter let's go let's do it between all the sports that you've worked in Cycling, swimming, cross-country skiing, uh, and working at it from grassroots level up to Olympic-level athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a favorite sport? Is there a favorite kind of race or event or something that brings out different things in different people because of the sport or because of the setting? Uh, you know, swimming was my life until uh, 2014. I, I would say that no. I don't think there's a favorite sport um, I could tell you that, um, I'll give you an example of a moment, I've had, you know, several special moments, but, um, you know, I came back from uh, the Olympics in 2012. I, I, I love the Paralympic movement. Um, I started the National Health and Fitness uh, Foundation, and every Thursday morning when the, par when the parliament's in session, I run swimming lessons for MPs at Chateau Laurier. Thanks you to Chateau Laurier. They've been incredible the last nine, ten years. That's such you know? a fun. It's like I always see that pool as like a James Bond oh, yeah, kind of magical, pool, right? It's like this this setting. I'm like the James Bond movie could be shot in here. Okay, but, so you have um, the pool of the shadow. Okay, but uh, one day, and you know, we've got um, you know Elizabeth May that started many many years ago, and you know, by the way, she just got married, which is pretty cool. But uh, she started swimming. She said, "I never swam. I haven't swam for a long time. Help me out." But one day, she brought this lady called Joyce Smith. And uh, Joyce Smith was an MP for Northern, Northern Winnipeg somewhere. And she said, you know, I haven't swam. I haven't swam for so many years. I lost, I think if I remember, I lost my brother to drowning and I've been scared. She said, you know, she's, she was an older MP and she said, I can't enjoy my grandkids when I go to Victoria Beach. Could you help me? And within two or three sessions, she was able to swim, swim in the deep end and so on. I could tell you that. Yes, I, I, you know, I was lucky enough to be involved with Olympic gold medals and to be involved with great teams and so on. That was one of the most special moments for me because 
You know, to me, I, I figured, yes, winning the Olympics is one thing, but helping somebody, you know, loving their life with their grandkids is as magical. And so um, I love watching kids touch the wall or go through with a smile on. You know, I, I keep saying to people, to a certain point, we create, we, we, we make impossible possible. And we create smiles. And so, yes, there is very sad moments when somebody misses the Olympic team by one one hundredth of a second. or But when I see the relationship between coaches and athletes and an environment created and create a, a great team, you know what? I think to me that's as magical as the performance. The performance becomes an offshoot of a great environment and, and a place where kids can't wait to go to practice. And think about this. Winning by one one hundredth of a second at the Olympics is not that day. It's probably the four other years where the athletes went, home, went to work out every day and feels like, I like being here. My, my teammates are great. Instead of, oh, man, you know, I hate it and the coach is such and such and this. You can't create the performance in a poor environment. You can't create a learning environment in a classroom where kids don't feel loved and feel special. Regardless of being 30 in a class, everyone has got a, 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 a something that lights them up. And I think as a coach, and I'd say as a teacher, part of your job is to find what inspires a kid to can't wait to get up in the morning, you know? How often have you felt that, I mean, I know for some, it's the child is beaming and loves being there and has a joy and has their own self-motivation. What happens, and I'm sure you've seen plenty of these examples, when you see it coming from a parent uh, and it's the parents dream and it's the parents <laughs> pressure and uh, sometimes living vicariously through their through their kids like how is a coach are you able to help the child through that situation and at the same time yeah. bring an awareness to the situation you know I, I don't have all, all that all the answers far from it and but, I, and I, but it exists it exists oh, okay. totally and and I think every situation is is something you have to ponder as a coach, look for help and talk to other people and say, okay, how do I go about this? You know, it's not just with the hammer. Maybe 40 years ago, the hammer would work, but today it's about engaging people. Um, and, you know, I've always thought of this commercial when I was involved in swimming of Ryan Cochran. Ryan, Ryan is, was our greatest, uh, we just retired, not, not just the greatest distance swimmer in Canada, but one of the greatest kids that I've met in a long time. I've always thought, you know, I'd love... I'd love to do a commercial with Ryan going and his arms around mom and dad by a dog going, you know what? Winning Olympic medals was really cool. But if it wasn't for mom and dad to get me involved in swimming and in swimming lessons when I was three and four, I wouldn't be here. So thanks, mom and dad. And all I could vision is, is for him and his dad or him and his mom to jump off the, the, the dock and do a cannonball. Because the joy and the love of active living has to start at home. And yes, some parents are not involved, but it create it, you know it takes a village to create a performance or create a child. So as a parent, you don't have to do everything. You don't have to know everything, but you have to find solutions for somebody else to to help if you have to. So for example, you can't drive your, your kids to work out all the time. Well, you partner with other parents and you carpool. There's always there's always ways when no, there's will. I get that. I go, but that that's a child wanting to do this, and there's oh no no not necessarily. That's a parent wanting to put a child. Just remember your kid when you put him in swimming lessons. They they scream and yell for oh the first God, few swimming I lessons. Oh my God! I fought tooth and nail. <laughs> I swimming. I you talk about swimming with a passion. For me, it was just like uh, my lips would be black and blue. <laughs> like I just did not react well. <laughs> like I couldn't wait till I graduated from the program and said I don't have to do this again. No, but I'm talking about parents who it's their pressure. It's their it's their mandate, and you have a kid who feels like a prisoner in the system. Like if they don't do this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, this is the only way to please mom and dad. Like, listen, I don't know, maybe because I'm Canadian, you can hear these hockey parents. Like you, yeah, you know. but there's no perfect parents, is there? I, you know, I, I, I had a discussion with uh, one of my siblings. You know, my father passed away, and you know, he, he was a great guy, and he was, uh, he was a hard man. And he came from, from a world that was pretty hard. And I remember telling my brother, I said, well, do you think dad tried the best he could? Or are you trying the best you can with your kids? 
Well, I, I don't think there's very many parents that will go, well, I'm really trying to, to mess up their lives. They're trying the best they can with the skills they have. I know Hockey Canada is starting a program for parents, to educate parents. And to a certain point, it's not always easy to be a parent, especially when you know, I had four kids in four different sports. So think about my poor spouse that were ran around trying to, to oh, do all of that. But, uh, but um, I, I tend to think that um, if you build a team with your team as a coach and a club, you almost have to help build a team with your parents. And I'd say the same thing with the school system. You know, if parents don't come to the teacher's interview, I bet it'd be really interesting if somebody take the, take the phone and, and say, you know, Mrs. Smith, uh, we really missed you in the interview. We'd love to meet with you. We want to talk to you about your kid. I think it's going to be an exciting year, and we'd love to share that with you. I know everybody's really busy, and that takes more time. But keep, keep remembering that we're in the people business. We're in the dreaming building, inspiration building. Teachers, coaches, even, you know, CEO or president, they need to inspire their employees to, to create magic. So, again, if we keep thinking, even as coaches, and sometimes coaches get tired because they get up at four in the morning and, they, and people well, call and, them and at 11 o'clock at night. And, and I mean, your, your career was coaching, but you have a lot of coaches that are parent that are parents on these teams, right? Like, so not only are they doing their day job, but then they're, they're finishing their day yes, job and yes, they volunteer yes. to coach their kids. Like I, I think those people are heroes. <laughs> in, in, I think our team manager is the hero. <laughs> I'm like, I can't, I'm not doing all this yes, planning. Yes, I give yes, you yes. full credit, whatever you want. However, however many bottles of wine you need, cause <laughs> I, I'm not stepping up to do it, but I appreciate that you, but are. you could do something else within the team, you know, maybe help okay. carpooling. You know, well, and so on we're so all forth. Doing, yeah, we're all doing, you know, I That's feel right. like we're all doing our part, but it's also been my world for a long time too. I've, I'm in a different world because as I mentioned, like I was a gymnast, like the, the background was gymnastics, but I have two daughters now that are in the competitive soccer. And I am now watching behaviors of parents on sidelines. And I'm like, where, how did it get to this point? I know. I, know. I mean, our kids are out on the field, like... Listen, my kid's not going to be an Olympic athlete or a World Cup player, right? It's just she's out, she's healthy, she's running for an hour and a half. But it is like it's vicious, and I and I'm I'm I don't know if I'm in, I'm embarrassed for all of us. <laughs> does, does it make? Does, yeah, you know what? It was funny because you, I, my oldest daughter actually did a move to New York yesterday. Uh, she's going to be dearly missed uh, on a day to day basis here, but. Uh, I would go even when she played soccer as a, as yeah. a 18, 19 year old. I would go just to just to <laughs> I would scream and yell inside the pool, go, go! and she'd go, Dad, you embarrass me. Like, like, but I was doing it just to, to kind of get everybody to smile. But yes, it, oh. you, you know, I go back. So that's why I think Hockey Canada is doing a good job at educating. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think officials should have the ability to red card parents. In any sport, I know we don't have that in in, uh, in swimming, but I think we should empower officials to say to coach, "Sorry, you're banned off the deck. You're, you're well, crossing yeah. the line." Or parents off mm -hmm. out of the bleachers. You know, we need to do that. Otherwise, I mean, you want a place where the less gifted athlete feels as loved and as appreciated as the the, the gold star, and sometimes they're the ones that get. They get to uh, feel the oh. unlove from the side. Oh, I can, I can sense it, and I, and I feel it, and I think we're. I'm trying to put everyone's behavior in check, right? <laughs> yeah, and so now I've, you know what, I've, I've and spoken to parents, but then again, I'm, I'm a bit uh, outspoken when it comes to that. And I'll go and I'll say, you know what, I think you're completely out of line. I'm not sure it's, if it's for everybody to do that, and I've had some comments back to me that probably weren't very nice, but that's okay. I mean, to me, if. I could make them think twice the next time to do it. Then, how how different? Because you have been in so many different countries and experienced different programs. Is there a difference between how grassroots how programs are done around the world? I mean, we see the success of what the Americans. I mean, sometimes I just it's also based on pure population, right? Mm -hmm. They have the numbers to choose from when you look at, you know, state of California. <laughs> to That's be a right. champion in California, it's like being a national champion here. You know, like, how different has it been? Because you've worked in the States, you've worked in Australia. Like, how, yeah. how different So that's a good question. A lot of people say, well, don't, don't you miss being in the States? Or don't you miss being in... Mm -hmm. in 
I mean, there's certain things I miss everywhere, but I could tell you that um, um, like, the difference, I, you know, let me go back with, the, with okay. the Americans. If the Americans had a focus, as a national focus, they could easily walk away with every gold medals in every event at the Olympics. But they don't have a national approach. They don't have the NCAA's are are over, you know, dealing with over training kids in certain parts, over using kids. I'm not necessarily sure it's the best thing for certain kids to go there in certain aspect. But um, you know, the Americans is all about. It's you know, I could do it, and I actually think that a lot of the performance by American is despite the coaching, not because of the coaching, because there's so many. Uh, people, number one, and I, I even remember some coaches saying to kids when I coached there, and I was lucky enough, I was coaching in an outdoor pool in Phoenix, Arizona, which was, you know, pretty cool. But coaches would say, you know what, if you don't want to do it, I've got nine other ones going to back you, you know, mm -hmm. place you, so you better get going. But, you know, the, the strength of the American system is the stepping stone of every, you could win at many different, in grade school, You know, you could swim. You could sw swim high school swimming. You could swim college swimming. You could swim club swimming. You could swim regional swimming. There's so many steps where somebody could feel that there's a place for them to be their champion in bracket, whatever that means. You know, could be improving, could be winning. Um, you know, for us in Canada and in other countries, these are the things we also have to help create: is success stories at many levels. Of, of stories. So, you know, if you're going to improve 100%, you could improve 1% 100 times or 2% or two times 50%. That makes it really hard. So for us as coaches, we need to create these stepping stone of success stories that people go, wow, that was kind of cool. I like, mm -hmm. didn't think I could do this and I'd do that. Um, the Americans are, you know, there's 370 million people. Um, you know, sports is part of their uh, lingo, especially in high school. I'd love to think that we have a, a bit more... Um, pride in the high school system sport here, but we should have the same thing in, 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 in art and music and school system. I'm sorry, I disagree system, with you. Know? I disagree with you. Well, I'm sorry, a, you're going to get, you're going to get 10 people to a high school football game after school on a Thursday. You're going to get a stadium full on Friday night lights in Texas at a football game. I'm, well, I don't, I don't get you, the you comparison know, you, there, Pierre. Well, I, th I think to me, if we could create a place where every kid has a place to want to try to train or want to mm -hmm. try to go and run on a team. I think if we could create that, we're never going to get the 6,500 kids on a high school Friday night high school um, high school game. There's no way it's going to happen. You know, so let's not try to imitate the Americans. Let's try to create the Canadian model. And I think one of them is every kid has a right to play at the high school and the grade school level. And let's find a way to make it competitive enough to to get the gifted ones a place to go and, and shine, not just because I got money and I could join a good team, you know? What's going to happen if we're not going to see this? What is going to happen? You talk about creating this fit, healthy, active lifestyle. What happens if this doesn't, if this doesn't resonate, it doesn't connect with people, and we continue to go on the negative where we are looking at inactivity, obesity, mm -hmm. uh, illness, Because people don't see this. I mean, we're talking and, and some people were like, okay, this is a really fun kind of inspiring story. But there's a flip side to it of what's going to happen when none of this, if none of this is accomplished. It's already happening. It's already happening where you, and you mentioned it, where there's a decrease of health and fitness and there's an increase of obesity, even for kids at, at, as a 10 year old. And uh, I, I believe that we could keep singing that story all the time. I also believe that we need to go back the other way around and, and create programs that will re-engage people in being active, starting from the community level up, using the schools to do that, having policies and implementing policies in the school system where you stop getting rid of the phys ed teacher and they're going, well, there's not enough money. Like To me, it's, it's incredible. Funny, I was driving here, coming to this thinking, I don't know if anybody told Doug Ford, do you really want your kids to be in a, in a school with 28 kids in a classroom? If that's what you really want, really? This is crazy to think that you're going to put so many kids in a classroom where they won't get optimum. Pierre, there's now classrooms that are going to be given online because they don't have enough teachers to do it. So you're going to have kids that are no longer even having to make the effort to get up and go and sit in a classroom where they can just actually sit, not ever move and watch and do the class online. I know, and that's... that's. And I'm talking high school students. And that's a sad time 
But so, do you not feel like we're in a losing battle? No, though? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I believe that, I do believe though that there's got to be um, vision created by by platforms of government, municipal government, provincial and federal government. There needs to be a national talk about getting people active, not just sport. Getting people active, you know, walking up and down the stairs, flights of stairs, and and going for a walk at lunchtime. I think we need to help. Here's one of the the, the things I, I thought about, you know, many years ago. You drive around, you see this ISO 9000, these companies that got quality assurance and programs. We have 338 riding in this country. We should highlight, you know, three companies per riding. That's a thousand companies in a country that actually help their 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 employees be active. Is there showers in their building? Is there bike rack? Are you helping your employees to have half half on the health um, clinic? Is there a weight room in your building? Is there a lunchtime walk program? You know, it. Let's not just wait for the government. We've got how many thousands of companies in Canada that are part of our solution. They're not just part of making money off our back or making... They need to be part of creating an environment where their employees also want to feel like there's a place for them to be active. Are you speaking? I mean, and I know in, in where you are in that you have these leaderships and these motivational talks with CEOs and with industry leaders and not just with politicians, but to be able to get these big, massive companies on board. Well, I mean, to me, I, I can't change their companies. And I think in Canada, you've asked me the difference between Canada and the U.S. And, and Australia. I think in Canada, it's about recognizing positive changes and making sure that we acknowledge um, groups and schools and companies that actually are making a difference in active living. So to me, it, it is about, you know, and I would love to think that one of the things that we could embrace is finding ways to highlight a program, ISO, whatever, to, um, to highlight companies that were part of the solution of a healthy C Canadian uh, government. You know, you know, another person that's quite involved is the Governor General. Julie Payette is quite involved. Governor Johnson was quite involved. We had a discussion about even making a program called Make It Three, meaning if I take my, my kids to swimming lessons, let me find two other families that will take kids to swimming lessons with me. If I'm a volunteer, I'll find two other volunteers with me you know, part of engaging a country totally is not just by yourself, but it's building the family. So, uh, you know, companies can challenge other companies also and be part of, you know, we're going to go and walk a thousand miles, you know, this month. How about you guys? So, yes, the government's part of the solution. Companies are part of the solution. School district and school superintendent are part of this. I also believe that you're only ever as great as your leader. And you see schools with incredible principles that are changing the lives of these kids. And you see schools with principles that are got two more years in their job and they're they're gonna kill the time, you know? So to me, everybody's got a role to make this country special. And we have no rights in Canada not to be part of the solution. No one. I love the passion. I do, and it, it makes sense. It does. Everything that you have said, <laughs> <laughs> it makes so much sense. Oh, my gosh. But it took 10 years, so 10 years with this National Health and Fitness Foundation to move. And I thought, huh, that's easy. We're just going to do it. And, and it, it took to me, it all, years? It took, well, you know, where we are today, yeah. where we have National Health and Fitness Day, we've got Bike Day on the Hill, and we've got all these groups involved with us and so on. To me, it all started when I was at Swimming Canada early on and I had a chance to go to the uh, Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, which was by uh, Mike Lazaretti's Blackberry People, you know. And you come into that office, beautiful building, beautiful front lobby. There must have been 500 bikes inside the front lobby of bike racks in the bike lot. And it was, they wanted to keep their employees to bike and they wanted the bike to be protected. And I'm going, Wow. That's awesome. Like, here's a company that's embracing active employees. That's kind of where my wheel started turning, going, here's the power of these companies to engage their employees at making a difference. So, yes, there is a passion. You know, the Titanic or, or a, a, a huge ship takes something like 50 miles to turn around 180 degrees. It's a long way around. But we can never give up on any. Can you imagine somebody giving up on your own kid? I don't think anybody, I, I certainly am not going to be the one giving up on this country. I think we've got the ability, 
you know, to be among the best, the fittest nation in the world. Yes, we're, you know, the motto of being the fittest nation in the world on earth is one thing, but, you know, you're going to move it. We got to move it forward. And I think there's a lot of groups that are doing this. We need safer routes for, for bikes. You know, can you imagine oh, it, one of the saddest moments? We had a bike summit and the next day at City Hall, Ottawa City Hall, and the next day right across the street on that bridge, somebody got killed on a bike. And, um, and so, you know, our world is not perfect, but we could make it better every day if we want to make a difference to make it better. And, you know, you could only change the world. You know, you're saying, oh, you can probably thinking this is, you know, utopic, but you could only change the world one person at a time and one moment at a time. So to me, if you make a decision, say, how, how can I make this better today? Mm -hmm. Then anything's possible, I think. If you don't go there, oh, like, I would hate to think that somebody goes, well, you know, our university really is a bad one, but I'm really glad your daughter's coming to our school. And we go like, no, 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 I want to go to a great university that's going to inspire my kids. Well, we need university leaders that are going to be inspiring 25,000 people to also be out and about and, and, um, and be great student, but great world leaders. And I go back to the point where so many people talk about uh, st university student going, you're tomorrow's leader. And I'm going, no, you're today's leaders. You know, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Let's make a difference today. You dealt with the CIS. You worked in inter-university inter sport. You coached an NCAA program. Like, there was lots of you. What do you think of a student-athlete? You know, like, I think there are, there's a different breed, right, in being able to be able to have passion and dedication to both. Because these are kids that aren't planning on making millions of dollars in their sport and yet yeah. have the ability to, as you said, have that passion to continue on and yet know that education uh, is where is, 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 is important. It, is important. Well, more and more, for example, we're losing some of our Canadian hockey kids to the NCAA's because they want to play hockey and they want to keep studying. You know, I, I you know what I I love the the CIS or I call you sport because not everybody is going to make the Olympic team, but everybody could have an incredible experience and being on a university a campus representing your brand, which was you know, the GGs or whatever else, I think is magical once you get there. And not everybody is the best athlete on that team, but I would hope to think that everybody on that team feels they're part of something special. The reason I was a huge fighter for the CIS is because, and the youth sport, is because, you know, if you quit gymnastic or swimming at 14 or 15, I'm not sure you had the best experience. Maybe coach was really hard on you or so on. But when you quit at 22, 23, and 24, and you had an incredible team experience at the university, I tend to think that these people might be the ones wanting to give back a lot more. They wanted to, to become coaches or officials or club presidents or fundraiser for the local club. So, yes, one is investing in a varsity program. You know, and for example, vo volleyball and wrestling, our CIS programs are most, some of the most important programs for the national team. Other sports, not as much. But when I see a kid walking around, and when I see even in Ottawa wearing kids wearing the Carlton jersey, the Carlton Ravens jersey or the GGs, even the 12-year-old, I smile because people want to belong to something magical. People want, and the university, we have 54, 56 universities. The universities have the ability to do that, you know? And could you imagine if one day we do an active day at the university? So in Singapore, three days a week, in all the schools, they turn off every elevator, um, escalators um, for students. Three, so, three days a week. Three days a week, in kids Singapore. have to walk up yeah. and down. And except if you're, if you're disabled, you could take the, the elevator. But... You know, so I, could you imagine if part of a movement within the 50, because part of the role of universities is to innovate and to be in the forefront of changes for this country, saying, you know what, in one year, we're going we're gonna to do the Terry Fox run, which is a magical run in September. And it's a great, it all created, it was created by a vision of some a young guy at a university to do something magical, change the world. And, you know, now there's Terry Fox runs around the world at every embassy. So the universities can become part of our solution. And the, that's why the CIS to me was, was a magical organization. The power of the presidents, not just 
scholastically, but inspirationally and athletically could be magical in changing our country. Start that at 20 and 25, you know, it's almost like an exponential. By the time they're 50 and 60, these people will stay active, a lot of them, and will want to give back. And, you know, I tend to think if they had a great experience in sport and you're president of ESSO or Rogers or Bell, you might invest back into, into the kids' sports. And I think to me, again, I go back, we got to stop waiting for the governments to do everything for us. We have to look at everybody to be part of the solution of making this country active and making a difference in a kid's life. And I would hate to think, and I go back, I would hate to think that somebody gives up on your kid. And so there's no kid that, and no adult that we should be giving up on, including, you know, and you, you probably drive, I drive on King Edwards a lot. And I feel, I feel that there's got to be a way to inspire one homeless person to change. And we do one, and we're going to do two, and we're going to do four. It's not easy. I don't have all the solutions. They've done you, some great programs with running. I know the running. Yeah, like they Phil Marsh is doing Phil great. Marsh has done a great job of that's right, that's these right. men in the mission. And you get them a pair of running shoes and they go for a walk. I, I, like, I love these stories, right? It's, it's part of our makeup. Yeah. And, and it's, getting, it's about sharing it. Getting 50-year-old moms that haven't done anything for 30 years because they were so busy building their families. Getting them back active. You know, and that, that's another story altogether because if we could get, you know, two or three or four women together coming back at it, it's a lot easier than one engaging themselves into uh, in all the research with, with uh, engaging active living for But that was like your story adults, of, you know? of wanting to go and be able to swim with the grandkids, right? You got to get back in the pool. You've got to get back, you know, going up and down so you can play with them at the park. It's it's about re-engaging and trying to find that passion as to why you liked moving and, and, and being active in the first place. So I, I had a chance to speak at a, at a pharmaceutical comp company that, that uh, basically were selling... Um, diabetic pill, medication pill. And I remember we're going to them going, you know, you think you guys, and we talked to you about the Olympic program and so on and so forth. I said, I'm not going to talk to you about that. I might give you some example. I want to talk to you about my dad. And I want to talk to you about what you guys do when you change the lives of adults because their lives are going to stay another 10 or 20 years and it could be with their grandkids and it could be with their daughter's wedding. That's what you create. You don't sell pills. You create family ties, development, you know? And so to me, that's what we create. I remember telling my dad, you know, that passed away a couple of years ago. I remember telling him when we moved to Canada, I said, we're not just here. And dad, I remember um, I was, we moved here end of April, 2005, Mother's Day, 2005, you know, two weeks later. And um, my kids, my kids had never played hockey before. They go with all their cousins in Beaconsfield and they're all playing street hockey on, on Roselyn, Rosen Drive in Beaconsfield. And dad's out in the window crying. And I go, what's up? And he goes, oh, I've been waiting all my life for that. You know, you go like, oh, that's what we want to create. A place where, where families feel special and feel there's, and we need to create families through the sports system and the school system and, and the world of active living, you know? So when you create families, you create that world, you create anything. I love it. I love the message. With that being said, where do you recommend people go for information or to hopefully say, okay, I, I hear you. Where do I, where do I start? Who do I call? Where do I look it up? Where yeah. do you suggest people go? Ask your neighbor first, you know, know your neighbor first, build a family around you first. You know, I mean, there's answers everywhere, but I think the first answer, you got to build your local community first. The other one is, I think, the school system. You need to be part of the solution to the school system. And as a parent, get involved in the school system. Not just not, be part of the solution. Don't wait for somebody else to create the environment for your kids because you never know the environment that they want to create. I also think there's all sorts of help. You know, like you go to the website of Hockey Canada, Swimming Canada, you go to the, the provincial bodies. But even Google, you know, if you look at an adult bike program, you go bike, pr bike clubs in Ottawa, Oh my goodness, there's women's club, there's men's club, there's groups. It's everything's out there. You just have to start looking around. You know, and you know, you, you're gonna laugh at me because my kids go, Dad, just go on the internet because I want some help or something. Just go Google what you want and you'll find it. And I go, Oh yeah, sorry. You know, but uh, it's all there. And including, you know, we talk about the National Health and Fitness Foundation. 
what was really cool about that for us is, yes, we started it. Yes, we said, you know what? You know, the, 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 the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. So we said, we'll create the foundation. We'll create the National Health and Fitness Day. We'll create Bike Day on the Hill. And then people are going to see it and they'll, they'll join us. And so now we've got all these bike clubs are, that are involved in making a difference. And we've got these walking clubs. That we've, so to me, look, ask. But I do believe that uh, building the local, um, local community around you is really important for your kids. And, um, you know, and one of them is you know, if you're at school, invite your, your kids' friends to your house and have a pizza party and, and go play in the street. So, you know, again, I, I'm not struggling with answers, but no, I, I, all the answers are there. Yes. You have to say, okay, what's my ultimate goal? I want my kids in music. Or I want my kids in gymnastic. How do I go about it? And then start going at it. And it's not just about winning. I'd have to, I, I, sorry, I, it's not just about being in sport. I tend to think that as parents, after dinner, you should go for a walk. I think within our world in Ottawa, we talked about embracing winter, but you know, if I'm 75 years old and not so steady, I'm not going to go walk on the sidewalk. So th these are, 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 are decisions that we need to be made politically also to help build an environment where people have the ability to be out and about and be safe, you know? I'm going to look at things with a different perspective for, for some time and, and observe, I think, more of my actions and the actions of people around me uh, and see kind of the changes that we can make. But I think hopefully that you've inspired teachers, uh, coaches as to the experience they want their athletes to be able to have and to realize that at every single point, there's this, uh, an opportunity to feel like a winner no matter what level I think that, mm -hmm. that they're at and, and still be able to admire those that are able to reach that Olympic podium and to realize the, the type of people that kind of went in for the journey with them. So I think you've got thousands of athletes right now who are going, Pierre, thank you so much for the experience that you created and, and hopefully to um, have inspired some people by listening today. So I think your dad would be incredible. I'm sure he was incredibly proud of, of, of what you were able to accomplish. Thank you for listening to uh, Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. Please, if you can, like, subscribe, Subscribe, share, let people know the discussions, the dialogues, the people, the guests that we have on the podcast and um, be able to share it and help this grow so that we can inspire others to be able to live healthier, active lives and be able to enjoy life a little bit longer. Pierre, thanks again. Yeah, thanks so much. Change the world one person at a time. We're doing it. Let's go.